In the 1940s, psychologists Kenneth and Mamie Clark designed and conducted a series of experiments known colloquially as the doll tests to study the psychological effects of segregation on African-American children. Doctors Clark used four dolls, identical except for color, to test children's racial perceptions. Their subjects, children between the ages of three to seven, were asked to identify both the race of the dolls and which color doll they prefer. A majority of the children preferred the white doll and assigned positive characteristics to it. The Clarks concluded that prejudice, discrimination, and segregation created a feeling of inferiority among African-American children and damaged their self-esteem. Which doll is the black doll? And which one is the white doll? That one. Which doll is the pretty doll? Which doll is the bad doll? Which doll is the nice doll? And which doll is the bad doll? And, what, and why is that doll pretty? Because she's white and he has two eyes. Which doll is the ugly doll? Why is that doll ugly? Because he, because he's black. Prelude. It is an undeniable fact that the past decades have brought a dramatic increase in racially motivated conflict in the United States, as well as around the world. As you continue to read this reintroduction to the true history of the race doctrine, what should become glaringly obvious is that we are witnessing a repeat of history. People being lulled into feelings of self-hatred and guilt based upon skin color. The media propaganda we are hearing today are reminiscent of the results of the Clark Doll Test of the 1950s, a social study which revealed that Jim Crow laws were psychologically damaging, causing young African American children to believe that the color of their skin inherently made them bad people. We are eyewitnesses to a repeat of history, with an unprecedented reversal. European Americans are now being labeled as bad based solely upon the color of their skin. Skin phobia is alive and well. Philosopher George Santayana once said, Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. The new humans of Generation X and the Millennials are scarcely aware that they are living through a glitch in the Matrix. A checkered past they are too young to know, and the old have long forgotten. The delusions of white superiority and black inferiority, woven into the fabric of our society ages ago, has returned yet again to haunt another unsuspecting generation. The demons of our forgotten history hold us hostage, separating us from the peace we could otherwise enjoy. The purpose of this book is simple, to present you the truth. I have been an eyewitness to the scarlet history of the ever-changing racialized storyline for the past 55 years, but the old gray matter is still sharp. I'm old enough to remember, yet still young enough to recall. I grew up in both the Jim Crow and the post-Jim Crow era. For the past 20 years, I've used my skills, developed from being a former New York City police investigator, as well as an avid lover of history, to locate the smoking gun. I have performed a thorough, unbiased private investigation, sifting through mounds of documents and historic records with the goal of untangling the tangled web. I'm here for the sole purpose of exposing the facts of the matter and providing an answer to those wondering what really happened? While well, nothing can change the past and erase the pain caused by years of injustice, the truth does have a way of bringing solace to the troubled mind. Does skin color, one shade or another, automatically make a person a bad seed? Were our forebearers inherently evil? Or were they brainwashed to behave in an evil manner? The answer to this question, based upon my 20-year investigation, is the latter. It was the cleverly crafted Jim Crow laws, used specifically for the purpose of mind control, not human inclination, as we are being led to believe by the latest propaganda. Jim Crow laws is actually the culprit behind the racial saga, guilty of inspiring a hypnotic, trance-like hatred between two perceived racial groups. 
The United States is a country with a history of normalized peculiar rules, predicated upon something we were all born with, skin color. During the Crow era, the masses were brainwashed into hating each other. Yes, under the penalty of imprisonment, as well as the penalty of death, you could be killed on the spot for looking into a person's eyes. Reckless eyeballing was used successfully in the 14th century manual called Malus Maleficarum, Hammer Against Women. The same mind control techniques used to bring women under control back in the 14th century was intentionally resurrected to be used again in the Jim Crow era. Skin color and loyalty to an imaginary caste system was used as a social monitoring tool. It determined your role in society as well as your status. In many regions, the only person worse than a person of color was one who sympathized with them. Human beings, those branded as white, were lynched to death in front of crowds, used as an example. This was the psychological message sent to anyone who was even thinking about breaking the rules. This is what happens to those guilty of the simple action of sympathizing with those deemed to be the enemy of society, those surnamed Negroes. Cafording, aiding, and abetting in any manner was looked upon as seditious. The term nigger lover is called to mind. The destructive damage to the human psyche caused by the race doctrine has left a stain upon the mass consciousness in such a way that people living today have been classically conditioned with a knee-jerk, triggered reaction to skin tone, one of which, in many cases, they are not consciously aware of. Liberating one's self from the shackles of race-based consciousness has a much-needed healing effect, paving the way for closure, reconciliation, and forgiveness. Understanding the causal relationship between race and racism itself is the key. When referring to the term race throughout this book, it signifies the classification of human beings, domesticated like a breed of animal, into distinct and separate groups. As you will soon see, this age-old accepted social engineering practice of the past is within itself the factor which has greatly influenced the continuation of conflict in our present reality. I have often sat to ponder what a world free of race clarification would look like. Insightful conversations with countless people who identify as either black or white, I have been a fly on the wall through over 10,000 interviews. The thoughts conveyed to these encounters have revealed to me a self-image of individuals inextricably connected to a race. Many of them could not identify with themselves apart from their identity as either black or white. Diving deeper, these conversations were marked with confessions of deeply rooted emotional scars resulting in feelings of jealousy, inferiority, guilt, and low self-esteem. These feelings stemmed from their subliminal acceptance of racial identity. I was deeply moved and taken aback by the strong sentiments these folks shared regarding their own self-image as it related to racial identity. Reflecting later on these conversations, it became quite clear that the individuals struggling with their own identity were equally oblivious to the fact that the belief system driving these feelings of inferiority and low self-esteem had no scientific or biological basis. God created human beings with no racial identity and man turned the natural order around, converting those unsuspecting humans into something unnatural, races judged not by merit but by the color of their skin. The stories we were told about race were stories made up by powerful men with a political and social agenda. For certain, the common man was not one to proselytize such doctrine. Surely this is fairly obvious from a historical perspective. The fact is that up until the past 150 years, Less than 20% of the population could even read or write. I grew up with people who had never learned to read or write. It's reasonable to conclude poor people who could not read or write did not create the rules. All they could do is blindly follow them. The dark energies that constructed the evil race doctrine were the wealthy influencers, those with lofty ambitions and the motive and opportunity to bring them to fruition. Kings and their wise men, magicians, masters of the dark art of deception, skilled at hiding behind the Bible and twisting its words. The story of Noah and the curse of Ham is one such example. Ham is noted as the one who stumbled upon his father Noah, drunk and naked in his own tent. Upon seeing this, he tells his brothers, Shem and Japheth, who proceed to help cover up their father without gazing in his direction. Ham, however, does not avert his eyes, and he sees his father's nakedness in full. When Noah finds out what his son has seen, 
he fatefully curses Ham's offspring. Noah dictates Ham's offspring as destined to be a servant of servants. In other words, a slave of a slave. From its earliest inception, the curse of Ham has been used as the justification for segregation and slavery. The few people back then who could read were taught to read from the Bible. The foundation of religion made it fairly simple to indoctrinate a person. Inferring that Ham was a person of color during Sunday service would be accepted as gospel and never questioned, in spite of the fact that at no point was color or race explicitly mentioned in the Bible story. The period in which the Bible was written predates the idea of a racial classification system, or even the etymology of the word race, for that matter. While our ancient ancestors no doubt noticed differences in our skin colors, they had no clear doctrine of race, not to be confused with culture, from the Latin word culer. Culer, which alludes to the place and manner in which human personalities developed socially. However, there is no scientific, biological basis for the social classification we call race. The first formal doctrine of race was published in 1449. Juan II, King of Castile, Spain, seeking to separate those deemed to have pure blood from those of Moorish and darker skin ancestry. The Spanish categorization and treatment of Jewish and African people was the Jim Crow of its day. This decree provided the seedbed for Christian negrophobic racism. This decree gave rise to concern over purity of blood. Limpeza de sangre, in Spanish, a doctrine that was to be understood literally, not metaphorically. Medical beliefs of the time held that blood was the principle of four humors in the body, because it circulated the other. Blood, therefore, played an essential role in establishing a person's character. Impure blood, or mixing with a less favorable bloodline, was believed to taint a person's character. In 1604, Historian Fray Prudencio de Sandoval compared the impure natures of those called blacks and Jews, aptly stated, Who can deny that in descendants of Jews there persists and endures the evil inclination of their ancient ingratitude and lack of understanding? Just as in the Negroes, there persists the inseparability between them and their blackness. This was the law of the land. The king said it, and this is the way it has to be. Most people of that time period had no interest in being beheaded, and so people grew used to living segregated. Because this was the social protocol that best fit the king's desires, this was not the ideology of the common people, those of whom they called peasants. Slavery and caste proved to be the right foundation for what was to follow, a rich man, poor man society. As wealthy businessmen of Spain and Portugal entered into the lucrative slave trade, a wealthy business of buying, selling, and trading human lives, formerly dominated by pirates at the Barbary coast of Africa. The North African states held a long history of slavery, and they had been enslaving their fellow citizens as well as Europeans for hundreds of years. Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli once made up the notorious Barbary coast. Opportunist European businessmen, seeing how the game of empire building was played, decided it was Spain and Portugal's turn to join the lucrative slave market. The Mediterranean seas were once ruled by Barbary pirates, from 711 CE to 820 CE. These ancestors of the Moors made Europeans as far as Iceland and Ireland cower with fear as they violently seized merchant ships and ruthlessly kidnapped Europeans to satisfy the demand for alabaster-skinned women in North African slave markets. This triad trickled down to coastal towns, causing residents to abandon their homes and belongings in exchange for inland safety. These turbulent relations paint a picture of conflict and mistrust. The bilateral enslavement exposes history in a way that is infrequently investigated. While North Africans invented slavery, Europeans, who also had been enslaving each other for hundreds of years, Italy was the breadbasket of Rome, certainly took it to another level. Mansa Musa, the emperor of the African state of Mali, was the richest person ever to live, with a net worth of over $400 billion. His great wealth attained by conquering and enslaving other humans attracted the attention of the European elite. When Mansa Musa went on a pilgrimage to Mecca in 1324 CE, his journey through Egypt caused quite a stir. 
the kingdom of Mali was relatively unknown outside of West Africa until this event. Arab writers from the time said that he traveled with an entourage of tens of thousands of people and dozens of camels, each carrying 136 kilograms, or 300 pounds, of gold. While in Cairo, Mansa Musa met with the Sultan of Egypt, and his caravan spent and gave away so much gold that the overall value of gold decreased in Egypt for the next twelve years. Stories of his fabulous wealth even reached Europe. The Catalan Atlas, an information map which could be considered the Internet of its day, created in 1375 CE by Spanish cartographers, shows West Africa dominated by a depiction of Mansa Musa sitting on the throne, holding a nugget of gold in one hand and a golden staff in the other. After the publication of this atlas, Mansa Musa became cemented in the global imagination as a figure of stupendous wealth, which he funneled to the Barbary Coast pirates, who in turn used this funding to enslave Europeans, who in turn responded by enslaving Africans. The rest is history. Without accepting the facts, namely that while Europeans enslaved Africans, Africans also enslaved Europeans, we cannot begin to understand U.S. policy regarding African Americans down to this day. Jim Crow laws and covenants of the late 1800s, forbidding the ownership of land by any descendants of Moorish background, as well as the host of massacres and crusades designed to keep people of color in their place, these actions were a direct response to events we have never until now been told occurred and never permitted to heal from. The correlation between the past and the present cannot be ignored. The dark energies of the race doctrine have never been used in connection with anything good. Nothing about the race doctrine, past or present, inspires a warm, fuzzy feeling. Nothing about identifying oneself as either black or white tells another person anything good about you except suspicions. Suspicions we, up until this late date, have yet to overcome. The ultimate goal of this book is to expose the mythological teachings of race as the clever mind-controlled tool it has proven to be. These misinterpretations and classifications are the cause of many evils we face today. By the time I was 10 or 12, I just wished to God I was white, you know, because they had food to eat, they didn't work, they had money, they had nice homes. And we would nearly freeze, we never did have food, we worked all the time, and didn't have nothing. Chapter 1. Why Didn't Black Lives Matter? When cultures clash, the winner often writes the history books, glorifying their own cause and disparaging their conquered foe. As Napoleon once said, What is history but a fable agreed upon? I approach this investigation with an impartial lens, considering each fragment of historical evidence as a piece of a composite puzzle. It is my hope that when this puzzle is assembled, it will offer a clear picture to all parties seeking redemption and closure. It's been said that it is the truth of the matter that set us free. Race, the root of all evil, is a book searching for such truth. We cannot begin to understand the cries of Black Lives Matter, without understanding why people of African ancestry were made to feel that their lives as a whole didn't matter in the first place. Living your whole life as a person of color in America, you always knew something was terribly wrong, but you could never quite put your finger on it. I remember when I was about 12 years old, my father sat me down to explain to me the abnormal, normalized facts of life when he was growing up. I suppose Dad was preparing me for what to expect from the world I was coming of age in. My father relayed to me the experiences of famous international celebrities of his day. Wealthy African Americans we watched in classic movies like Nat King Cole and Lena Horne. Megastars who filled showrooms at the El Rancho, Flamingo, and other venues had to spend the night in substandard segregated motels. Legendary jazz musician Louis Armstrong the man whose raspy voice had serenaded millions with tunes like What a Wonderful World, a superstar who was credited for inventing the New Orleans-style jazz. Louis Armstrong had traveled the world, rubbing shoulders with kings and queens, mingling with them on a first-name basis. However, upon returning to his hometown of New Orleans in the heat of Jim Crow, he was told he could only stay in run-down Negro-only hotels. In 1953... Academy Award nominee 
Dorothy Dandridge, was performing at a Las Vegas hotel. During her downtime, between shows, she decided she would visit the pool area. After deliberately dipping her toe in the water, the staff ordered everyone out of the pool, then closed and drained the entire swimming pool. I thought my dad was making this up. However, I knew the torch had been passed to another generation when my own son questioned me of why he was constantly being pulled over by the police, simply because he was driving a brand new Hummer. These peculiar stories go back generation after generation, as far back as anyone can remember. The first step in understanding such a strange and complicated history is by coming to grips with the uncomfortable demons of our past. The truth can only set us free, if we tell it. Most people seeking to understand our jaded past are only familiar with the fact that people of European ancestry enslaved an estimated 12 million people of African ancestry. This has been the theme of every slave movie ever made, from Roots to Twelve Years a Slave. It's always the same basic storyline. The bad white people enslaved the black people, and the good white people set the black people free. But no one has ever told us the story of how and why the Moors enslaved the Europeans. The story of slavery has always been pitched to us from a unilateral perspective, never bilaterally. I thought that was strange. People of African ancestry enslaved about the same number of Europeans as North Africans, who enslaved them nonetheless over a much longer period of time. And yet no one has mentioned it? In analyzing both sides of history, we can now begin to consider how bilateral enslavement has influenced modern-day racial conflict in the United States of America, and perhaps begin to understand why Dorothy Dandridge was not permitted to go into the pool. In considering how bilateral enslavement has impacted U.S. policies, I focused on finding historically accurate evidence to inform my thoughts and conclusions. I sought out scholars of history and educated myself on a variety of perspectives. The books I dove into during my research were as follows. The Barbary Wars, American Independence in the Atlantic World by Frank Lambert, 2005. Jefferson's War, America's First War on Terror, 1801 through 1805. Joseph Whelan, 2003. To the Shores of Tripoli, The Birth of the U.S. Navy and Marines by A.B.C. Whipple, 1991 and republished in 2001. Victory in Tripoli, how America's War with the Barbary Pirates Established the U.S. Navy and Shaped a Nation by Joshua E. London, 2005. These scholarly texts allowed me to create a timeline of history, linking conflicts between a newly formed United States of the past to the present-day chant around the world to finally make sure that black lives matter. 1620 is the year England delivered its first shipment of African slaves to Virginia. Fast-forwarding over 150 years to 1776, America's independence from Great Britain marked an unprecedented era of economic liberty. Free from the Revolutionary War, America found itself inheriting England's slaves, as well as their system of law surrounding the treatment, status, and handling of slaves. The Founding Fathers grappled with their newfound slaveholdings, inheriting an English system and set of laws they had previously renounced while fiercely declaring their own independence. As they defined America as we know it today, the authors of the Constitution faced new and unprecedented challenges. Among these challenges was the persistent seizure and enslavement of American citizens and cargo ships traveling through the Straits of Gibraltar. These violent seizures of citizens and ships had been the plague of Europe for hundreds of years. The Barbary pirates were viewed as the bullies of the Mediterranean, a group of religious zealots that nobody wanted to mess with. In 1785, when America was only nine years old, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams decided it was time to confront the bullies of the Barbary coast, traveling to London to meet with Tripoli's ambassador, Ambassador Abd al-Rahman. It was the hopes of Thomas Jefferson to reach a diplomatic agreement to end the relentless attacks tariffs, and ransoms being levied against American ships by North African pirates. America at the time was paying 10% of its GNP to the Barbary states. In seeking out a diplomatic agreement, Jefferson pleaded with Tripoli's ambassador, fervently questioning what right the Barbary states had to prey on American ships, demand tariffs, and enslave both crews and passengers. The ambassador Abd al-Rahman coldly replied to Jefferson, stating, 
It was written in the Quran that all nations who should not have acknowledged their authority were sinners, that it was their right and duty to make war upon whoever they could find, and to make slaves of all they could take as prisoners, and that every Muslim who should be slain in battle was sure to go to paradise. Pushing for a diplomatic agreement, Jefferson swiftly replied to the ambassador that the United States was not a Christian nation, and played no part in the Crusades or the Catholic Reconquista of Andalusia. Without missing a beat, Ambassador Abd al-Rahman did not fail to brag about the size of his own commission in the transaction. The outcome of these decisions became clear. If America chose to pay protection money to North Africa, they would have an alternative to the relentless piracy they endured. It seems it was this very moment of contention with the ambassador of Tripoli that precipitated Jefferson's strong will to bring war upon the Barbary kingdoms as soon as he had command of the American forces. Contrary to Jefferson, many Americans, John Adams among them, made the case that it was far wiser for the USA to fork over tariffs and protection money to North Africa rather than experience piracy and the accompanying loss of trade. Keeping the hearts of the nation in mind, Adams eerily warned that a battle against North African pirates would be too rugged for our people to bear. We ought not to fight them at all unless we are determined to fight them forever. Adams' warnings were left to echo into silence as reports of the maltreatment of enslaved Americans spread abroad. America's wait-and-see approach to the North African conflict quickly changed the conversation from diplomacy to preparation of war. Many look back and feel war would be justifiable, when you consider the historical recounts of brutality, mistreatment, that enslaved Americans experienced at the hands of the Barbary Coast pirates. Historian Thomas Sowell offered his perspective, saying, The treatment of white galley slaves at the hands of the Barbary Coast pirates was even worse than the treatment of black slaves picking cotton in the South. Most of these slaves spent the rest of their lives doing hard labor for Muslim masters in northern Africa or manning the oars on Barbary galleys. Most of the women ended up in a harem. The Barbary states of North Africa had plundered seaborne commerce for centuries. They demanded tribute, money, seized ships, and held crews for ransom or sold them into slavery. Although Professor Sowell's vivid perspective shines light on the possible motivation for Jefferson's call for war against North Africa, I wholeheartedly disagree with his generalized comparison. I have read the diaries and essays of European slaves who escaped their captivity in North Africa, living to tell their stories. Yes, definitely cruel and brutal. However, I've also read about the actions of some slave masters in the Southern American states. The inhuman practices of feeding the babies of enslaved women to crocodiles. I have not heard every report. Without that knowledge, how could anyone compare European slavery to American slavery? How could anyone compare anyone's pain, for that matter? It's my opinion that the mutual enslavement and terms thereof by both parties were indeed pure evil. In May of 1801, conflict between North Africa and the United States reached a boiling point when the Parsha of Tripoli, Yosuf Kalamansi, declared war on the United States with the ultimate motivation of demanding more revenue. Pasha was an esteemed title held by many rulers of Tripoli, in retaliation to this declaration of war, the United States commissioned its newly formed naval squadrons to head out on their first overseas military engagement. The Marines' hymn many Americans living today are quite familiar with carried the American soldiers into war. From the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli we fight our country's battles in the air on land and sea. First to fight for right and freedom, and to keep our honor clean. We are proud to claim the title of United States Marines. The battles began violently with Tripoli successfully capturing a U.S. Navy ship, the U.S. Philadelphia, capturing and enslaving most of the crew. The few American soldiers that did escape went into hiding, but did not back down. Instead of disappearing into safety, American Navy officers snuck into the Tripoli Harbor, where the ship was kept overnight, killing the guards and setting fire to the Philadelphia to prevent the enemy from benefiting from the use of their ship. The tactful and resilient approach of America in its fight against North Africa 
brought wide-reaching respect to the USA as a nation to be reckoned with. Employing diplomacy, backed by resolute force, the conflict with North Africa eventually paved way to the end of the practice of paying tribute to the pirate states. The international dispute involving the United Kingdom and the Netherlands ultimately ended in 1815. American ships could not pass freely without fear of piracy and loss of trading. A short forty years later placed another important landmark in the timeline of American history with a young Abraham Lincoln setting out to end slavery in the United States. His hopes to end the practice of slavery was overshadowed by the deep-seated fear of revenge. Many of Lincoln's contemporaries viewed him as insane. Pushing forward against this fear, on January 1, 1863, Lincoln declared that all slaves in America were free. While this declaration was groundbreaking and novel, not much changed for the enslaved. They continued to work their fingers to the bone for landowners in the southern states for decades to come. Even with Lincoln's purposeful declaration, the United States Civil War ripped through the infant nation. The Northerners won many battles, the most famous of which took place in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. The four-year-long Civil War grounded to a halt on April 9, 1965, with the South admitting defeat. Five days later, while enjoying a theater performance in Washington around 10 p.m., Lincoln was shot by the famous actor John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln died a few short hours later. In 1866, the Ku Klux Klan, or KKK, began amidst the political, economic, and social upheaval that was the aftermath of the American Civil War. Originating in Tennessee, this movement quickly spread to other states in the South as it targeted the most primal fears of Southern white populations. Claiming to seek justice for crimes against whites, reiterating antiquated social status quos, and ensuring white supremacy were top priorities for the Klan. The history of the extreme violence of the transatlantic slavery trade, as well as America's enslavement at the hand of Barbary forces, culminated in the widespread acceptance of the belief that truly freeing slaves in the United States would mean suicide. Fueled with the same paranoia as the Founding Fathers who called slavery a necessary evil, American slave masters remembered Tripoli, the terrorization perpetuated on Europeans by the North African pirates. Slave masters entertaining such fears were ignorant of the fact that the people of African descent are one of the most culturally diverse people in the world. There are at least 3,000 ethnic groups and 2,000 languages spoken in Africa. Many African groups taken from their homeland were as foreign to each other as their European masters were to them. But all the slave owners saw was brown skin, and a fictional doctrine called race. They lived in constant fear of slaves mounting an insurrection. One of the slave master's greatest fears was also that the whipping, family separation, rape, and crimes they carried out would come back to haunt them as forms of revenge. While African Americans were free on paper, much of the freedom they were promised was reversed during the years post-Reconstruction. This left the fate of African Americans to be gradually turned over to individual states, many of which adopted restrictive Jim Crow laws. These hateful laws enforced segregation on the basis of race alone. These archaic rules and regulations, based upon British systems of law and the general running of penal colonies, were aimed at keeping African Americans in a similar status level of those granted to prisoners of war. The hateful and infamous words Senator Ben Tillman spit out on the South Carolina Senate floor on March 23, 1900, still stains our present thoughts in society. Tillman stated, I have never believed the black man to be equal to the white man, and will not submit to his gratifying, his lust on our wives and daughters without lynching him. Examining these words, we can see Tillman believed that one group has the right to enslave another. However, this was based on the erroneous belief that humans can be categorized by race in any meaningful way. His beliefs mark history with a sad effort to marginalize and oppress the African-American people in his own nation and beyond. During the Radical Reconstruction period of 1867 through 1877, many pro-slavery writers argued that without slavery, which supposedly suppressed their animalistic tendencies, blacks were reverting to criminal savagery. Books and literature of the post-slavery era 
did much to create an atmosphere of fear, portraying former male slaves as innately savage, animalistic, destructive, and criminal, deserving punishment, maybe death. One such author writes, This brute is a fiend, a sociopath, an antisocial menace. Charles H. Smith, a popular writer of the 1890s, claimed, A bad negro is the most horrible creature upon the earth, the most brutal and merciless. Another author, Clifton R. Breckinridge of 1900, a contemporary of Smith's, said of the black race, When it produces a brute, he is the worst and most insatiate brute that exists in human form. George T. Winston, 1901, another negrophobic writer, claimed, when a knock is heard at the door, a white woman shudders with nameless horror. The black brute is lurking in the dark, a monstrous beast crazed with lust. His ferocity is almost demoniacal. A mad bull or tiger could scarcely be more brutal. A whole community is frenzied with horror, with the blind and furious rage for vengeance. Our turbulent history of slavery has seeped into present day with white supremacy groups fearing much of the same things their forefathers feared over a hundred years ago. A fateful day may arrive when revenge is enacted against the population identifying with whiteness by people of color. Through analyzing scholarly text, historical battles, and the fundamental facts surrounding America's history of bilateral enslavement, we can begin to understand the motivations and fuel behind race theory today. The highly tense and turbulent environment that categorizes our understanding of race today can be traced back to these early erroneous beliefs about race. It is only when we begin to thoughtfully navigate through this complex history that we can begin to understand why there is no need to categorize dynamic and unique human beings by the made-up construct of race. By focusing on unity, harmony, and mutual understanding we can begin to heal as a nation and move forward without tumultuous racial tension holding us back. This is the story of the slave trade between Europe and Africa, a tragic tale of coastal villages raided and men, women and children carried off into captivity, loaded onto ships, taken to be sold as slaves in another continent and never seeing their homes again. A familiar enough narrative except that in this case, the villages being depopulated in this way were English, and the slave traders arrived in ships which had sailed from Africa. Long before the British ever became involved in the slave trade, slavers out of Africa were raiding not only the British Isles, but many other European countries. From Iceland to Malta, Ireland to Spain, and Italy to the Netherlands, carrying off white slaves to be sold in the slave markets of Africa. Chapter 2. The Real History of Slavery When people today think of slavery, many envision the forms of slavery that existed in America from 1492 to 1865, the transatlantic slave trade, one perceived racial group owning and exploiting another. However, the history of slavery is a bit more complex than that. It's important to know that slavery predates the concept of a racial classification system and can be traced back to the tribal wars of people living in a region of the world we today call Africa. This practice dates as far back as prehistoric times, before people kept records, and was apparently modeled after the domestication of animals. In time, it expanded to include women taken as captives of war and forced to be field laborers or concubines. However, later, it was expanded to include men, we know that slavery is prehistoric because the first inscriptions on Sumerian clay tablet cuneiform are records of slavery. It's logical to assume the act of slavery preceded its record. The earliest known system of law pertaining to slavery were recorded over 5,000 years ago in Hammurabi Code. Slavery has existed for so long that the majority of people remain unaware of its true genesis. For the record, from 700 to 1492, North African elitists enslaved Europe, much like Europeans later enslaved Africans. In many cases, kidnapping them from their homes, binding them in chains, and forcing them to endure long sea journeys exposed to unsanitary conditions while confined to the slave quarters of the ships. 
Much like the African diaspora, the majority of those kidnapped were never seen by their families and friends again. Initially, Europeans were not specifically targeted for enslavement at the hands of the Barbary pirates, and they were not targeted by skin color or a racial classification system. Racial classification came later. Slavery was a threat to anyone who traveled in the Mediterranean or who lived on the shores of places like Italy, France, Spain, and Portugal, and even as far north as England and Iceland. It was estimated that 1.2 million people of European descent were systematically preyed upon and sold into slavery. However, the tables turned in 1492. Spain, once controlled by the Moors, was conquered by King Fernand and Queen Isabel. Christopher Columbus made it quite certain in his writing what his agenda was. His writings reflect the exact intentions and state of mind. Immediately upon landing in the New World, on October 14, 1492, Christopher Columbus writes, With fifty men, they can all be subjugated and made to do what is required of them. Those were not mere words. After his second voyage, Columbus sent back a consignment of natives to be sold as slaves. It was Europe's turn to get into the business of owning slaves. They began domestically enslaving the local natives. However, this proved to be exceedingly difficult. Some scholars argue that Native American enslavement was problematic because the natives were so prone to illness or escape, but others maintain that it was only when the Native Americans, racked by war and enslavement, began dying in large numbers that English colonists turned their attention to importing slaves from Africa. The transatlantic slave trade was born. While the defeat of the Moors at the hands of European elitists in Granada, Spain, marked a change in juxtaposition of African regions holding European slaves, many Europeans still remained in pockets of slavery in North Africa as late as the 1800s. So, while Europeans were buying and selling African slaves in America, many Europeans were still being sold in North African slave markets. Those who were captured by pirates were sold in public slave markets to rich people or to the royal palaces to become housekeepers, concubines, or forced to marry their masters. While Barbary corsairs looted the cargo of ships they captured, their primary goal was to capture non-Muslim people for sale as slaves or for ransom. One woman who was captured and sold into the North African slave market actually escaped and lived to tell her story. In an essay entitled The Imprisonment and Escape from Captivity of Mary Velnitz, an early 19th century woman, Mary Velnitz tells her story from the viewpoint of the eyewitness of the brutality suffered by European slaves at the hand of their North African masters. In her whole essay, Mary does not mention race a single time. She does not draw a single reference to skin color. Her story is especially informative because in her essay, Mary Velnet draws attention to the same patriarchal domination that hallmarked the theme of slavery from its inception 5,000 years before, namely, women kidnapped by men for the purpose of servitude. Mary Velnet, an Italian lady, was married to Henry Velnet. Her husband was a wealthy businessman who engaged in East India trade. He asked her to join him at Canton, where he was at the time. She set sail on the 20th of June, 1797. Two months later, the vessel was attacked by the Tripolitans in North Africa. As a result, she and the other passengers were captured and taken to the Tripolitan shore to be sold in public slave market. Consequently, she was bought and became a slave for seven years. Her slavery experience inspired her to write an essay describing her captivity. For three years of her confinement, she was kept in a dungeon, fastened with irons, and on four occasions she was put through some of the most cruel tortures ever invented. At the beginning of her story, Mary Valnet draws attention to the fact that the dangerous trip that led her to being captured and enslaved by North Africans was not her idea. She had followed her husband. She focuses on the fact that she belongs to a patriarchal society which implies the idea of men controlling women's actions. It also involves the idea that men dominate women in society. In this context, she defines patriarchy according to various influencing factors which result in the existence of patriarchy. These include the ideological, biological, sociological, class, mythical, psychological, and education. 
These components strengthen patriarchy as a racial institution that governs each family and so classifies both men and women in different societies all over the world. During her enslavement, Mary was able to draw parallels of the general mistreatment of women, regardless of where they were, and whether they were a house servant in Europe or a slave in Africa. Mary believed that her problems had resulted from her husband's request or her master in Africa. During her enslavement, she was ordered to prepare meals for other men, fellow slaves. However, what seemed ironic to Mary was that she was forced, under penalty of death, to be at the service of men who were also slaves. Mary was a slave of a slave. First, she was forced to obey the orders of her male captives. Secondly, she was obliged to serve enslaved men, who were in the same situation as her. To be at the service of man silently means to accept her situation without any objection. Here, Miss Mary Valnet reinforces the idea of the fact that being a woman keeps her at the service of man in whatever situation and social position. Women doing domestic work and keeping silence are some of the basic doctrines of patriarchal ideology, even in different cultural contexts. After meditating on this chapter, it's hard to ignore historical records that imply that women were the first slaves, as well as the fact that women in remote parts of the world are still slaves, either physically or psychologically, to a male patriarchy. The issue from the beginning is the use of other human beings for their power. E equals mc squared is an equation derived by the 20th century physicist Albert Einstein, in which E represents units of energy, m represents units of mass, Energy is equivalent to mass. This proven formula can be used to better understand our present imbalance of power and gain a clear picture of how power has been monopolized for over 5,000 years to the detriment of the world. Of course, I'm referring to the practice of one human being using another for their energy or slavery. In this chapter, we've already established that neither white men nor black men were responsible for slavery. Because there is no such thing as race, we cannot connect a real act, slavery, to a fictional character. However, it is a fact that man, Y chromosome, invented and perpetuated the barbaric act of slavery. The nightmare of slavery has been able to exist in a perpetual cycle, which continues to this day, because I believe men hold too much of the collective power, the power that rightfully belongs to the masses, the people the whole, not just a selective energy-grabbing group. Where did man acquire this energy? The answer is simple. He got it from women. By mentally and physically enslaving her, taking away her voice and suppressing her ideas, then relegating her to servitude. Be it the physical restraints of slavery or the psychological shackles of being a Betty Crocker housewife, it's all the same. In doing this, Man has converted the world from a right-brain-thinking matriarchy to a left-brain-thinking patriarchy. You've read the history. In terms of collective power, bear in mind that the mass of humanity is all-inclusive. It is a collective of over six trillion cells per person, multiplied by the current population of eight billion people. That is the total energy, E equals mc squared, of humanity that runs our world. There is a set amount of combined energy. When they are combined from a right-brain-oriented perspective, there is synergy. Synergy is a state in which two or more people work together in a particularly fruitful way that produces an effect greater than the sum of their individual efforts. Synergy amplifies the energy of the masses, while patriarchy robs it. The masculine force, unbalanced by the feminine, is assertive, egotistical, logical, analytical, doing, controlling, aggressive, striving, projecting, hard, organizing, rushing, thrusting, always pushing the natural limits. This is the mind that rules our world. The right side of the brain is feminine, of that which is material, creative, delicate, intuitive, nurturing, receptive, tender, surrendering, synthesizing, integrating, soft, feeling, and the part of us that knows without explanation. Its roots reach deep into the heart. A wise person once said, 
the feminine helps us to be. This form of energy softens the constant male-driven doingness of our lives, which has become part of our misguided and relentless efforts to survive in a material world. It's inevitable that at some point in history that the powers will be balanced, gently shifting from a left-brain dominant society of slavery to a right-brain compassionate world of freedom. This book is committed to that end. They say there are two Americas, one for people of European ancestry and one for people of color. In recent years, there has been a dramatic increase in people identifying themselves as white supremacists. Folks who want a monochromatic America made up of people who only look like them. Well, during the research for this book, I had the opportunity to live with such people. A group of men who actually call themselves white supremacists. Obviously, they knew I was a person of color when I showed up at their door. But that was only after... I doc you sign the lease. Chapter 3 Living Undercover with White Supremacists There was a simpler time in America, a time when racists wore white sheets and carried torches, when Nazis bore the Nazi symbol of the swastika, and a skinhead could shave his scalp without being mistaken for the cool dude sporting the bald look. But those days are long behind us. Now, apparently, white supremacists walk among us, cleverly concealing their true identity by blending in with the honest American citizens, police officers, doctors, lawyers, housing agents, etc. I know this because I lived with them. White supremacy is not a racial classification, because there is no such thing as race. However, it is an extremely powerful brand that people use to, one, convey their desire to live in a world with people who only look like them, or two, supporting their beliefs and propagate the idea that they are a race called white people, and that the white people are superior to all other races of people. It was not my plan to go undercover into the twisted world of white supremacy. I guess you could say I stumbled into it. Forrest Gump's mom was right. Life is like a box of chocolates. In this case, you never know whom you are going to rent a room from. An assistant manager made the critical mistake of approving my rental agreement before meeting me in person and noticing I was a person of color. We spoke several times on the phone before meeting at the rickety old haunted-looking jungle house located in Ocean Beach, California. The caretaker, Billy, would later lament, I couldn't tell he was black over the phone. In Billy's defense, it's hard to tell what color a person's skin is over the phone. I live for the day when it doesn't matter. After meeting in person, I immediately noticed the change in his demeanor, from one of warm friendliness to one of cold apprehension and nervousness. Billy had that shocked, guess-who's-coming-to-dinner look on his face. Obviously confused when the voice on the phone didn't match the face of his perception at the other end of the door, he nervously tried to conceal his glaring apprehension behind anxious rambling and small talk. Billy was about sixty years old. His opening statement after hello was, I had a crush on a black girl once in high school. Not sure what that had to do with renting a space, but that was only the beginning. This was followed by in-depth questions. Another resident named Tom joined Billy in grilling me for almost an hour. Inquiries designed to disqualify my application. I sensed right from the start that neither Tom nor Billy were used to being around people of color, that it was going to be like the old Negro days. I was the Jackie Robinson tenant of the hippie community, with which they claimed some allegiance. In its long history, the Jungle House had never hosted a person of color in their subculture. I was the first. Billy, the gray-haired, soft-spoken assistant manager, had accidentally broken the cardinal rule, no blacks allowed. After I moved in, he was severely reprimanded by Donald, the manager, a skinny, long-haired, bearded man, about forty years of age with a hot temper. He openly screamed at Billy for renting the space to a person of color. Bill nervously answered in his own defense, We needed the money to pay some bills. I told you about him over the phone. You said it was okay. Donald responded angrily, You didn't tell me he was a goddamn nigger. I come home to my house and find a goddamn nigger that's living in my house. I was right there. I knew from the beginning what I was getting into. I was free to leave but I chose to stay. 
Writing a book about racism was one thing. Living in a house full of racists and documenting their daily behavior was another. If we are ever going to understand the darkness that lurks in the hearts of racists, someone had to go in there. I ended up being that someone. Dr. Lee Martin, a well-known microbiologist and good friend who helped me to edit this book, along with a good many other people, witnessed the horrors, the violent temper tantrums, death threats, and constant flow of bigotry that followed from Donald's lips, as well as other white supremacists that were frequently hanging out or staying around the property. Yes, I am racist. I just don't like those people. These were Donald's own words, which he uttered to an unsuspecting liquor store clerk. Concerned about my safety, Sal decided to warn me about Donald's confession to him. This explained everything. The powdered lie poured in my bed, the cutting of my cable wires eight times, the destruction of my personal property, the threats made against my life. Yes, four of them encircled me. Donald felt most powerful when he was around his cronies, as he explained how easy it would be to make me disappear. Nothing Donald or his cohorts said surprised or frightened me. A former New York City police officer. I think I've heard it all. I had no problem separating my personal feelings or emotions from my undercover assignment. This was a rare opportunity. I believe I was there for a reason. America needed to see this portrait, perhaps one that she herself created. Finally, we get to see the face behind the hate crimes, one we usually only hear about in the aftermath of the destruction of the synagogue or the mosque or the burning of churches with little children singing inside. It's a rare occasion to live with the actual white supremacist and take a unique look into their dark and twisted world. Donald and Billy were of this dangerous and violent breed. On one occasion, I had to stop mild-mannered Billy from breaking the arm of a poor woman who one evening had walked into the house looking for a friend. Violence toward women is common with racists. They commonly are also sexist. Fortunately for this woman, she escaped with just a few bruises. Donald and Billy were like peas and carrots. Donald was more aggressive with his hatred, while Billy was more reserved. It seemed Donald hated everyone, perhaps even himself. He would always refer to women as bitches and whores. In the FBI profile of white supremacists, it is documented that these types of social deviants often hate women and are cruel to small animals. I never witnessed any blatant cruelty to animals, although I'm not sure if bestiality constitutes cruelty. I and two other people on several occasions overhear Donald having sex with his dog Bella, a speckled, overweight pit bull who slept with him in a tent outside every night. Many nights, Bella would hide from Donald. You could hear the echo of Donald's drunken screams while searching the grounds for his four-legged mate. Donald's voice piercing through the air of the jungle like Stanley Kowalski, from A Streetcar Named Desire. Bella! It's difficult to know whether or not the relationship was consensual. You never knew which Donald was going to show up. There were times, ever so brief, when Donald attempted at being a civil human being. At one point, I felt like we were making some real progress. One day in the kitchen, Donald decided to open up about why he hated black people. I had been waiting for this moment. He explained that as a child, black people victimized him, the skinny little white kid picked on and bullied by black people. I could not ignore Donald's alibi. It made sense. For me, being openly discriminated against by so-called white men was a rare experience. White racists never affected my life on a daily basis, except on an institutional level. Most of my lifelong conflicts, being robbed, assaulted, or just out-and-out -out hated, have been with people of color, too. I know that not all so-called black people are like that, and that not all so-called white people are like Donald. Perhaps he was just mirroring his own fears, and perhaps my presence in the jungle reminded him of a memorably painful experience of his childhood. I believe deep down inside Donald wanted to change, and I wanted to offer him that opportunity. I wasn't there to judge. For me, this was a social experiment. What should we do with racists in our society? both so-called blacks and whites. There are more Donalds out there. They are products of a system that created them, told them from birth that having white skin makes them superior. Donald and millions of people like him have been living a life of delusions and, unfortunately, real psychological condition. 
I believe strongly that Donald and millions like him, through centuries of abuse, were bred to hate people of color. Through force, the concept of white superiority was branded into their psyche as a means of social control. European explorers quickly discovered long ago that the majority of the world's population was made up of people of color and that the same majority of the world possessed all the resources. In order to preserve their position of purity and control, the world resources, incidentally, they now control all of the world's resources. The elite devised a plan to create a concept of biological races and make the so-called white race superior to all the other non-white races. A so-called white race cannot be superior to other races if only one race exists. So a complex racial hierarchy was developed to segregate the body of humanity that under normal conditions would operate as one humanity. In all fairness to people who identify themselves as white, they must realize that they too are victims of the charade, as most of the world are victims as well. Those so-called whites were singled out as the pasty, bamboozled, used as a subterfuge to carry out a coup d'etat against humanity, born into a society that used their image as a standard of humanity. I can't help but wonder whether the ancient text found in the Bible contained a cryptic clue into this act of sedition against the free world. Let us make man in our image. Increasing numbers of people are beginning to understand that the concept of race was contrived. Society is slowly melting back into the unified structure of oneness, a more natural connection that connects all life into what the ancients called the great web. What we need to understand is that self-serving men created a two-race society for the grand prize of divide and conquer one white, and the other non-white, or black. Those who played the game were given privilege, power, and prestige. Over the years, many European Americans, whites, simply accepted their role without even questioning it. Today, all of those misconceptions are being challenged and debunked. One of the biggest challenges society faces today is recognizing the error of its ways. The whole white supremacy and black supremacy concept is falling apart. You know your racial construct is in trouble when DNA tests prove that you're a part of the same group you claim to hate. A self-proclaimed white supremacist attempting to turn a small North Dakotan town into a white-only town has undergone a DNA test, which to his surprise proves he is of sub-Saharan African heritage. Craig Cobb, 62, submitted to DNA tests as part of the Trisha Show's ongoing Race in America series, and was given the results of the DNA diagnostics test by the host on the air. Upon hearing the results, Cobb immediately dismissed the news that genetically he is 14% sub-Saharan African, 86% European, as statistical noise. What's problematic for black and white supremacy overall is that the whole three-party, black, white, Asian, racial story is falling apart. People who claim to hate European or African people are making fools of themselves and everyone who follows them when DNA tests reveal that they themselves are a good percentage, genetically speaking, of the same groups they claim to hate. Hatred of other people is actually detrimental to the genetic human diversity needed to have a healthy human family. Genetic studies indicate that inbreeding poses a great danger to unborn children when the parents do not have enough genetic diversity when two people carrying the recessive gene try to have children, in many cases the child is born with birth defects, or the fetus is miscarried due to the lack of genetic diversity in the DNA. Offspring of biologically related persons are subject to the possible impact of inbreeding, such as congenital birth defects. The chances of such disorders increase as the relationship of the biological parents get closer. Incestuous reproduction produces an increase in spontaneous abortions, prenatal deaths, and postnatal offspring with birth defects. Unless a couple decides to have a DNA test before having children, no one can be sure of their genetic diversity. Biologically speaking, nobody knows for certain exactly what they are. People who went their whole lives believing they were predominantly African because of their dark skin color are surprised to find out that they are a good percentage European. And people like Craig Cobb, a self-proclaimed white supremacist who believes he was pure European, was shocked to learn he was 14% sub-Saharan African. After this news became public, Cobb himself was a victim of white supremacist hate crimes. 
Famed historian Dr. Henry Louis Gates, Jr., said, I was shocked to learn that, although I looked more African, I'm actually a lot more European, genetically, than I am African. As a matter of fact, I am 56% European and only 37% African. In 2006, PBS did a show called African American Lives. Henry Louis Gates, Jr. was the host. Gates chose nine famous African American, black Americans, people to do DNA testing on. Gates wanted to see what these people were genetically mixed with. The show had some nice surprises and verified that many so-called black Americans are mixed to various degrees. Music producer Quincy Jones's DNA test revealed he is 34% European and 66% African. Sociologist Sarah Lauren Lightfoot's DNA revealed that she was 45% European. All three of these people, including Gates, have caramel brown skin, yet have a high percentage of European ancestry. Gates himself, through a strange set of circumstances, learned that he is related genetically to James Crawley, the police sergeant who arrested Gates in his own home for disorderly conduct. Responding to a report of a break-in, Crowley ordered the professor to step out of the house. He refused and was arrested. The incident became national news, with President Obama saying the police had acted stupidly. After the incident, Gates himself started receiving hate mail and death threats. The way the story is going, I wouldn't be surprised if the people making the threats to Mr. Gates turned out to be a not-so-distant relative. At the age of 12 years old, I shot myself. I was in the house. Police knocked on the door. I was right there. They knocked the door down. Everybody jumped over my body to go get the guns and drugs and whatever they could find. It took one guy to stop right there and, and cuss everybody that hopped over me out. Like, what the f are y'all doing? They said, oh, no, 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 we was going to see if it... What the f are y'all doing? We called the ambulance. Oh, an ambulance, do you not see this kid on the floor with this hole in his chest? Say, you, you drive. Pick me up. Brought me to the hospital. He didn't drop me off at the ambulance and say, you take him. He brought me to the hospital room and made two and stood there and waited till the doctor said he's going he's gonna to make it. He said, don't worry, my name's Uncle Bob. He was white as snow. The that hopped over me was blacker than me. Was he a cop? Yeah, he was a cop, and my life was saved by a white man. I don't know what racism is. I know a good m name, Uncle Bob, though. Chapter 4. We All Share a Common Origin Malcolm X eerily predicted today's conditions of racially charged tension and economic instability over 40 years ago when he said, I believe that there will ultimately be a clash between the oppressed and those who do the oppressing. I believe that there will be a clash between those who want freedom, justice, and equality for everyone, and those who want to continue the same old system of exploitation. I believe that there will be that kind of clash, but I do not think that it will be based solely on skin color. Brother Malcolm's prophecy was astonishingly accurate. The oppressors cannot survive by just exploiting brown people, because after a while, they will be depleted of brown people and will need new candidates to expand their campaign against the full spectrum of humanity to meet economic quotas. Brother Malcolm saw the writing on the wall. He predicted a period when humans who were forced into a condition of mutual oppression and commonality of purpose would put aside differences in skin color and merge for their common good and survival. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, We may have all come here on separate ships, but we're here in the same boat now. In early 1968, Dr. King and other civil rights leaders planned a poor people's campaign in Washington, D.C. The group planned to demand that the United States President and Congress help the poor to get jobs, health care, and decent living conditions. Campaign organizers intended the campaign to be a peaceful gathering of poor people from communities across the nation. But weeks before the march was to have taken place, Dr. King was assassinated. Thousands of people participated in the march in Dr. King's memory on May 12, 1968. They were armed with this mission statement clearly enunciated by Ralph Abernathy. We come with an appeal to open the doors of America to the almost 50 million Americans who have not been given a fair share of America's wealth and opportunity, and we will stay until we get it. 
It's difficult to ignore the comparisons between what Dr. King and the Poor People's March were trying to accomplish and what protesters around the world from Occupy Wall Street to the streets of Egypt are demanding today. The faces have changed, but the issue and the question remain the same. If the 99% or any other well-meaning faction ever wishes to reconstruct our society fairly, they must deconstruct the social construct of race and social equality from which our present dilemma first arose. For the minorities are now the majority, and the handwriting is spray-painted on the walls. The majority has traditionally been the lone voice crying for equality, a cry that even now has not been answered. From the time of slavery to Jim Crow, and from Mahatma Gandhi's peaceful protest to the civil rights era up to and through today, the issue has always been the same racial divide-and-conquer approach to final conquest. This begs the question of why we even need a racial classification system. Race is a social construct inspired by the same dominant 1% group of society that controls the world, and that has used and perpetuated the mythological teachings of race and class distinction. The elite created segregation, apartheid, race, nationalism, class distinction, and even caste systems to maintain worldwide submission. Each of these artificial systems drains the profound power of synergy from the human family. This is inspired by the love of money that has long been at the root of humankind's evils. It was none other than the dominant financial groups in our society who control the media, banking, and political empires used to impose and expand the original boundaries of group membership by promoting and defining race in terms of erroneous biology. This initial misconception of the biology of race helped to draw the color line. The boundaries of group membership were marked by skin color. Developing a new level of thinking is precisely what we need to do today. And the magnitude of crisis that we now face may prove to be the catalyst for doing just that. The world we seek must be grounded in equality, unity, and solidarity. In short, we must do away with the artificial racial construct and its economic hierarchy before it does away with us. We should also aim to teach people that the most important scientifically indisputable fact about race is that races do not actually exist. This is the core issue that must be handled before we can go forward together to face together the challenges that affect us all. Universal equality is interwoven into the fabric of the universe. The artificial systems on Earth are collapsing because they have reached a point where they cannot develop any more based on pure fantasy. The idea of free, unlimited expansion is no longer realistic. There has to be a point of return. Only a return to the universe's system of oneness makes sense. The choice that you and I make as we express our beliefs in our living rooms and around family dinner tables have meaning for the people in our immediate lives, as well as for those living around the world. Race, constructed from a European vantage point, has always been the basis by which the U.S. society and economy meet our access to wealth and power in a pernicious wealth gap that is based upon skin color and has persisted in being the determining factor as to how the cake should be cut. Our current beliefs pertaining to race are based on philosophical ideas and data that were popularized and cemented into place in the 17th century. This period in history, the so-called Age of Enlightenment, provided the pretext for the errant 18th century European theories concerning human differences. Those theories that, to this day, survive and are ensconced in our notions of reality. The exploration and exploitation of Africa, Asia, and the Americas brought Europeans into contact with people whom they had never before witnessed or even imagined. And this resulted in a veritable culture shock. The rise of those enlightened included thinkers like Voltaire, Rousseau, Kant, and Huma, among others, who speculated on human origins and greatly influenced European ideas on economics, justice, government, and science. It was from these enlightened thinkers that the period of the myth of race evolved into a subterfuge that was in turn used to create divisions among the targeted cultures. David Hume was one of many philosophers that postulated about African inferiority. Hume, Kant, and Hegel were hailed as the most enlightened thinkers of the 17th century. Hume believed strongly in the idea that Europe, its inhabitants, traditions, and cultures should be the exemplary model for all the rest of humanity. These ethnocentric beliefs led Hume to declare in his famous essays thusly, I am apt to suspect the Negroes to be naturally inferior to the whites. 
There scarcely ever was a civilization notion of neither that complexion nor even any individual element in action or speculation. From these words it is clear that Hume attached great importance to complexion, or the color of one's skin, in accordance to a prominent role in the determination of a person's rationality or irrationality. Hume further comments, There are no ingenious manufacturers amongst them, on arts nor sciences. On the other hand, the most rude and barbarous of the whites have still something imminent about them. Such a uniform and constant difference could not happen if nature had not made an original distinction between these breeds of men. I find it quite safe to say that race was an elitist European concept absent from African and Asian cultures, based upon a form of pseudoscience that is quite primitive when compared to what we know today about the tight genetic makeup of the human family. Bear in mind that the perspective by which history is written often depends primarily upon who is telling the story. What they called science of latter centuries, or philosophical wisdom, followed much the same path. Much earlier, Socrates had established the fact that one cannot depend upon those in authority to have sound knowledge and insight. He demonstrated that persons might have power and a high position, yet be deeply confused and irrational. He reinforced the importance of asking deep questions that probe profound thinking before we accept an idea. To this end, I have considered a wide variety of expert opinions on the origins of race. Molecular anthropology and genetic technology are now forcing us to profoundly rethink long-held beliefs. Scientists from the American Anthropological Association unanimously agree it is monumental facts that race is a myth as all humans are at least 99.95% biologically identical at the DNA level. The Human Genome Project was an international research effort that determined the complete sequence of the human genome and identified all the genes that the genome encodes. The U.S. National Institute of Health and the Department of Energy coordinated the Genome Project. Additional contributors include universities and nonprofit institutions across the United States and international partners in the United Kingdoms, France, Germany, Japan, and China. The Human Genome Project finally began in 1990 and was completed in 2003, two years ahead of schedule. The project has utilized source DNA samples from thousands of people from all inhabited continents. These sequences are in turn matched up with interested donors who wanted to know their cultural background. Once geneticists have a person's DNA and determine its markers and sequence, it can actually be compared to the universal database of genomes from natives from various countries and areas to calculate percent relatedness, from which a place of origin for that person's ancestors can be estimated. Interestingly, all branches of this family tree led inevitably back to Africa as its cradle for all of humankind. What is now obvious is that we all came from Africa by way of different routes of migration that our ancestors took to get there. It is now clear we are all indeed cousins from Africa. You may be wondering why we all look so different if we all came from Africa. Humans first arose in equatorial Africa, where there is constant and regular sun throughout the year. With all that sunlight, the darker skin of our African ancestors synthesized much higher levels of life-essential vitamin D than most humans obtain today. About 5,000 years ago, one mutation in the human's genome's 3 billion bases of DNA occurred and is responsible for the appearance of light skin in humans. White skin, with less melane, synthesizes vitamin D in sunlight six times faster than dark skin. Because they could not synthesize sufficient vitamin D to survive in lower levels of sunlight, these humans were able to successfully migrate to higher and lower latitudes around the world. Had nature not created this initial pigment variation in our skin color, our ancestors would have struggled even more with their survival, and if we had no ancestors, there would be no us. People who lived in hotter climates would have never withstood the sun, and people who migrated to colder climates would not have survived either. Our existence hinged upon adaptation to climate and environment. At this point, however, we are still a homogeneous sort, in that all humans are minimally 99.95% identical at the DNA level. The 0.05% difference was, in a way, nature's method of ensuring that the other 99.95 would survive. What we have mistakenly called race for this time was actually nature paving the way for all of us to have humanity over all of Earth. We are all comprised of matter, 
and the state of this matter is determined by the strength of the bonds between its atoms at a molecular level. So the world can only be as strong as its weakest link. Thus, if we build a society based upon fear and separation, then we will find ourselves in a world characterized by fear and separation. Similarly, if we build it upon hatred, then hate will fill the world in which we live. This is our core issue. Given the manner in which we have been socially classified through the illusion of race, we have become fictional races through indoctrination. Once we become indoctrinated, we do not devote much time to questioning its rationality. At this point, the innocent mind dies away. The mind that did not know to fear other people based upon skin color now accepts this fear as a part of life. The mind that was born to love everyone is now corrupted to love only those who look like them. We live constricted lives in lonely spaces, void of world citizenship and absent of feeling connected to a global society. As Dr. Martin Luther King said, it really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied together into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. We are made to live together because of the interrelated structure of reality. Before you finish eating breakfast in the morning, you've depended on more than half the world. This is the way our universe is structured. This is its interrelated quality. We aren't going to have peace on earth until we recognize this basic fact of the interrelated structure of all reality. Obviously, this book is about new ideas and new ways of thinking. As I travel the world lecturing or exchanging ideas with native culture, more and more I am convinced that people are ready for change. We are indeed witnessing a changing of the guard, from the old way to a new way. People are no longer supporting the basic behavior and thinking that date back to the Middle Ages. <laughs> Chapter 5 How Life Got So Far Out of Balance As a proud member of the baby boomer generation, I have had a front row seat to the quickly turning pages of history. Like many others of the same generation, I am both old enough to remember and young enough to vividly recall the black and white photographs of a simpler world. My memory dances to the tune of the Beatles, Hendrix, and Motown. My senses awaken, remembering the smell of a classic cinnamon-laden homemade apple pie. In stark contrast, I can also recall the civil rights movements, passionate anti-war marches, assassinations, and protests that characterized this very same period. My generation carries the memories of simplicity as well as trauma. Before my eyes, I witness the ending of an era. Good music and homemade meals have been washed away by, unforgiving passage, by the unforgiving passage of time, replaced by GMO foods and the repetitious beat of hip-hop music? Us baby boomers have awoken in a colorized, computerized, high-tech world encoded by passcodes and software. Our very own children carry forward this new generation, communicating through tiny screens and fingers flying across keyboards. Their brains are not wired for the slow, simple living we once knew. As with every generation, their brains are attuned remarkably different than any generation prior. On the surface, the universally common transitions from childhood through to adulthood look to be similar today to the journey humans have faced in any other generation before. We share and bond through basic milestones of growth and development. The key difference today is that, as a society, we are experiencing a transition further and further away from each other as we move through these life milestones. Indigenous tribes experience these milestones as a collective whole, with an accepting and open ideology. Our indigenous consciousness, once rooted in community and acceptance, has morphed into modern ideas of self-focused racial classification and hatred for others. Modern humans' sense of self is separated from others, distinct and individually motivated. This perspective is a radical departure from the harmonious perspectives we once nurtured. In this same departure from harmony, Albert Einstein poignantly described this sense of self, stating, a human being is a part of the whole called by us the universe. 
a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts, and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. Einstein's line of thinking points to the value in community and shared experience. In an aim to do so, we continue to analyze our indigenous roots. This shows us that the concept of I did not appear to be part of the human experience up until very recently. Indigenous tribes understood themselves as a communal we, much like a colony of bacteria or ants. Our not-so-distant human kin moved and existed as a true collective. Our departure from this collective can be directly linked to modern-day racial conflict, individualistically motivated and separated from one another. We have lost sight of the communal harmony that was once commonplace. We have adopted and accepted the idea of the self as separate from our communities. This misconception has taken on a life of its own, deriving dangerous modern race perception. If we accepted that the human family exists collectively as one unbroken stream of consciousness, we would see no need to classify each other by race or any other measure. Oneness is the essence of our existence a universal law pointing us towards the intuitive desire to see ourselves as equals. Indigenous tribes often tapped into this oneness through dances, worshipping the planets and galaxies, seeing themselves as only one small part of a whole universe. Even before scientific discovery, these tribes had an innate sense for the interrelated structure of reality, the complex web of life, echoing their worship and rooted in the knowledge that we are all connected as a single divine expression. We can loosen our grip on individually motivated ideas of self, hatred, and race. My search for truth and understanding led me to research our ancient ancestors, the Koshian people, our oldest living ancestors. We carry the genetic markers as their ancestors. They contain none of the genetic blueprint that marks our unique journey. My research and investigation led me to an ancient tribe untouched by most of the propaganda of modern humans. Their simplistic nature serves as a reminder, helping us to remember how we used to be. Much like other indigenous tribes, the Kojin people were rooted in values of community and honesty. They valued Mother Earth, believing that they would be punished by God if they mistreated the environment. In their long history, there is no evidence that the Kojin people ever exploited nature, with some experts describing them as the world's greatest conservationists. They led honest lives, and without deception as part of their custom or society, the truth was all they knew. In line with this truthful knowledge, the Kojin people were able to see their lives as one small contribution to a larger human family. These honest lives were made up of small, nomadic family groups led by no one leader or chief. The older members of the tribe, male or female, shared their boundless wisdom and advice with all. From an early age, these elders taught children the importance of the environment, the names for each plant and tree. Depending on nature to survive, they lived in a serene existence as hunters and gatherers. They recorded their lives on the walls of caves, painting unique rock art that is still treasured today. As the oldest living tribe in the world, the Kojin people originated in southern Africa, also known as Bushmen. What is unique about this tribe is their untraceable genetics, while every person on Earth today has a record of their genetic markers in a DNA library of information, the Kojin people do not share our DNA. They stand alone in both values and genetics. The Kojin people exist in the earliest living human testament and record of the way human beings were before the process and effects of imperialistic habituation converted most of the world into drones of domesticated humans. This tribe of Bushmen lived together in peace and equality for thousands of years before male colonists eventually came along. When the colonists arrived, the Kojin people's problems began. As reported by the Kojins themselves, other African states as well as European settlers came, colonized, and introduced foreign agricultural methods unseen by generations before. Ecological decline became rampant. Introduced to a new Eurocentric way of life, Ancient native cultures suddenly appeared markedly different to outsiders in both appearance and way of life. However, this difference or uniqueness should not be mistaken for being barbarian or ignorant to the modern technologies of the time. Quite the opposite, 
Their value for Mother Earth, simplicity, and community serves as a highly advanced model for a successful human society. In investigating the colonist Eurocentric influence, award-winning anthropologist and author of Guns, Germs, and Steel, Jared Diamond, addresses the question, why did Eurasians demonstrate other cultures by means of superior guns, population-destroying germs, steel, and food-producing capabilities? After gathering extensive research through fieldwork with indigenous cultures worldwide, he purports that Eurasians dominated other cultures not because of differences in intelligence amongst races, but environmental differences. Speaking of another indigenous tribe, the author and anthropologist goes on to say, New Guineans are more intelligent, more alert, more expressive, and more interested in things and people around them than the average European or American is. Diamond holds these traits in the highest regard when it comes to the survival of the fittest. I agree with Mr. Diamond's hypothesis, which seeks to demerit Eurocentric thinking and racist explanations of inferiority and superiority to others. It is wrong to think the industrialized European colonists were in any way better or superior to ancient tribes that tended to the land before them. Mr. Diamond's inquiry inferred that modern Stone Age people were probably more intelligent, not less intelligent, than industrialized peoples were. We must look to the hallmarks of the Khosian peoples, societies, and attitudes to see the value inherent in their communities built on cooperation. While the Europeans brought industrialization, the Bushmen had their harmony, connection between clans, and value for nature itself. Looking back through history, the Khosian people stand apart with this sterling example of life and community rooted in togetherness. What we must aim to learn from these indigenous tribes is how to bring our lives back into balance. We can learn from the Khosian, whose customs exclude selfishness and personal antagonism. Without ownership of property, these indigenous tribes focus on enjoying and taking care of their land until it was time to pass it on to the next generation. This perspective on sustainable environment living is needed today more than ever. Looking at the scars left behind by imperialism, we see a jagged interruption in the passing down of the sacred information we needed to build harmonious societies. By focusing on caring for Mother Earth and living in harmony and cooperation, we too can build a reality that is much like the balanced lives the Cogens led. The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Chapter 6. The Global Elite Plan of the Ages Many years ago, a group of elite, wealthy English businessmen sat down in a smoke-filled room sipping some of the best Scotch whiskey money could buy. These immensely ambitious brokers of power, the richest in the world, sat in a circle and hatched out a plan to control the world and all its wealth, even long after they were dead. Utilizing a color-coded, socially engineered ranking system called the caste system, this social gradient coding system had already been used successfully in building empires for thousands of years. They would now turn their attention to using the same system to assure that the bloodlines of their prodigy would exercise complete control over the planet Earth, even after their deaths. One empire under the complete and total control of their family. They drew up a 100-year plan to A. Gain control of the world, and B to guarantee that they always maintain control of the world and everything in it, even after death. In the manifesto called Confession of Faith, written in 1877, Cecile Rhodes, the father of the Blood Diamond, a popular name for the wars in parts of Africa over mineral rights, a self-proclaimed imperialist and wealthy diamond mine owner, Rhodes expressed his dream of an Anglo-Saxon ruling class controlling the world. This ideology is in sharp contrast to the dream of civil rights activist Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who believed that all men should be equal. Rhodes believed that imperialism was the key to political and economic power. Rhodes originally wrote this on June 2, 1877, in Oxford. The following are Rhodes' own words. I contend that we are the finest race in the world. Any other race should not exist. Humans being born that are not going to be raised in the Anglo-Saxon race, are a waste of human life. Rhodes considered Irish and Germans inferior to the English, and Africans as the lowest race of all. 
He wanted to make the British Empire a superpower, in which all of the white countries in the empire would be represented in the British Parliament. He freely states, Why should we not form a secret society, with but one objective to the furtherance of the British Empire, and the bringing of the whole uncivilized world under British rule, and for making the Anglo-Saxon race but one empire? Rhodes wanted to promote and propagate an American elite class of philosopher kings, who would have the USA rejoin the British Empire. His purest dream is made clear on how and why he wanted the entire world to be exact similes of the Anglo-Saxon race. He did respect the Germans and the Kaiser, but he still thought that his envisioned race and society was the superior. His contempt for humanity is evident when he states, Africa is still lying ready for us. It is our duty to take it. It is our duty to seize every opportunity of acquiring more territory. And we should keep this one idea steadily before our eyes, that more territory simply means more of the Anglo-Saxon race, more of the best, the most human, most honorable race the world possesses. To form such a scheme, what a splendid tool a secret society would be. A society not openly visible, transparent, but that would work in secret for such an objective. Rose's actions indicate that he was fanatically serious regarding world domination. He established the African state of Rhodesia, named after himself, but presently called Zimbabwe, and used his considerable financial resources derived from the control of De Beers Group, a family of companies that dominated the diamond ring, diamond mining, diamond hops, diamond trading, and industrial diamond manufacturing sectors, and gold fields of South Africa. Goldfields Limited is a South African gold mining firm, one of the world's largest which is listed on both the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange, to form the British South African Company. The British South Africa Company, BCAC or BCA Co., was established following the amalgamation of Cecile Rhodes. Central Search Association and the London-based exploring company LTD, which had originally competed to exploit the expected mineral wealth of Mashonaland, but united because of common economic interest and to secure British government backing. Under the name of the British South Africa Company, Rhodes sponsored a British military force from Rhodesia as part, of the infamous, as part of the infamous scramble for African land and resources. He worked to encourage British settlement in northern and southern Rhodesia until his death in 1902. At his death, he was considered one of the wealthiest men in the world. In his will, he decreed that his vast fortune should be used to create the Rhodes Scholarship for the purpose of educating future leaders of the world. Former President Bill Clinton was one of the most famous recipients of the scholarship award. When Clinton delivered his presidential nominee acceptance speech at the Democratic Convention on July 16, 1992, he mentioned toward the end of his speech that, As a teenager, I heard John Kennedy's summons to citizenship, and then, as a student at Georgetown, I heard that call clarified by a professor named Carol Quigley, who said to us that America was the greatest country in the history of the world. Professor Quigley, according to the Washington Times, specialized in the history of a secret group of elite Anglo-Americans who had a decisive influence on world affairs during the first half of this century. Quigley, it turns out, was a conspiracy theorist, but one who had an impeccable pedigree as one of the few insiders who came out and exposed the Eastern Establishment plan for world government. These words belong to Tom Bedlam, research director for the John Birch Society. While you are scratching your head... I might mention that Cecile Rhodes fits the description of a sociopath. His views are not the ideas shared by most people who desire to abide together in peace and harmony. However, it would be irresponsible to dismiss the ideology of Rhodes and the idea that after his death, other sociopaths are not busy meticulously carving out his dreams of world domination, especially in view of his record of genocide throughout Africa. Although he is gone... It is estimated that Rhodes was responsible for the deaths of approximately 130 million Africans. One hundred years after his death, his dream of colonialism is alive and well, and the bloody specter of imperialism continues to march its way around the world. I cite the cases of Egypt, Syria, Libya, Iraq, and Afghanistan as a few of the latest victims of imperialism exploitation. Are the Rhodes Scholar recipients running the insane asylum we call our world? the forces of negativity are a myriad and wide-ranging, whether intentional or unintentional. Man has already shown that he can do it. He can wipe out entire populations of people from the face of the earth. I found the following segment from the astrophysicist Dr. Stephen Hawking's quite interesting. 
He voices the opinion that man needs to establish himself on another planet as soon as possible, because it is most likely that mankind will destroy itself. Sadly, under current conditions, it would likely be rich people who are the first to leave Earth. And they likely would claim all the resources everywhere else, too, even the Moon and Mars and beyond. The present world system, under the imposed male-dominant social hierarchy of race, has already resulted in great atrocities against humanity. Today man has much more technologically advanced weaponry to carry out an even larger and swifter mass genocide and extinction. The same technology used in identifying genetic commonality can be used to create viruses and diseases that only affect certain genetic groups. This has a high-tech genocide capability. It does not have to be that way. The glaring language of love, unity, and solidarity of the feminine energies screams out to us through harmonious resonance being channeled by the universe. Do we hear its call to all of us? These are revolutionary times. All over the globe, men are revolting against old systems of exploitation and oppression. And out of the wounds of a frail world, new systems of justice and equality are being born. The shirtless and barefoot people of the land are rising up as never before. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Peaceful, harmonious thoughts are much like music. They create an uplifting momentum in the collective consciousness and a veritable field of peace. The Tasmanians certainly did not know the ways of war until they were confronted with violence. Peace begets peace, and violence begets violence. An increase in incoherent thoughts and feelings creates a momentum of stress in the climate of consciousness. Coherent or uncoherent thoughts are broadcast via the collective consciousness, much as music is transmitted via invisible waves to a radio. The universe is humming the melody of love. If all of us could only learn to sing the song, if we could only perch ourselves high upon a mountaintop and become like a harp facing the four winds, we could allow the gentle breeze to create music through us, each one a different string, vibrating the song of the universe. And together in this way, we become the harp of God. We were told that we would see America come and go. And in a sense, America is dying from within because they forgot the instructions on how to live on Earth. Chapter 7. Failure to Heed a Warning the European settlers believed that America represented one nation under God, somehow believing that God liked one section of the earth better than the rest. Despite the warning of many noteworthy native Indian leaders, such as Chief Seattle, who wrote this letter in December of 1854, the president in Washington sends word that he wishes to buy our land. But how can you buy or sell the sky or the land? This idea is strange to us. If we do not own the freshness of the air and the sparkle of the water... How can you buy them? Every part of the earth is sacred, every shining pine needle, every sandy shore, every mist in the dark woods, every meadow, every humming insect, all are holy. We know the sap which courses through the trees as we know the blood that courses through our veins. We are part of the earth, and it is part of us. The perfumed flowers are our sisters. The bear, the deer, the great eagle, these are our brothers. The rocky crests, the dew in the meadow, the body heat of the pony and human beings all belong to the same family. The shining water that moves in the streams and rivers is not just water, but the blood of our ancestors. Our land is sacred. The air is precious to us, and shares its spirit with all the life that it supports. The wind that gave our grandparents the first breath also received their last sighs. The wind also gives our children the spirit of life. Will you teach your children what we have taught our children? That the earth is our mother? What befalls the earth befalls all the children of the earth. This we know. The earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. All things are connected like the blood that unites us all. We did not weave the web of life. We are merely a strand in it. Whatever we do to the web, we do to ourselves. It is obvious that our ancestors failed to heed Chief Seattle's words of warning. We all share in the common web of life, and this is not a structure that we can arbitrarily change according to whim without breaching universal law. Yet, since the inception of American society, the myth of race has been used as a tool to distinguish those who have versus those who have not. This is done for the sake of profit and to maintain a division within the human family that always ensures a position at the top. Such attitudes, popularized by the concept of eugenics, 
have already resulted in genocides and complete extinctions of close and distant relatives of the human family, as was the case with Cro-Magnon man, early Homo sapiens, considered to be a cousin of modern humans. Cro-Magnon man was atomically almost identical with the people of today. Although no conclusive DNA links have yet been discovered, Cro-Magnon man has been considered as cavemen. In terms of physical characteristics, Cro-Magnon man was taller and more muscular, yet they are still classified as Homo sapiens, knowing man. They made tools just like us. They used fire and made clothing, and even venerated and buried their dead, just like us. And they were killed off by Homo sapiens. We modern humans have already demonstrated a propensity towards self-annihilation. This is also evidenced by the forced, complete extinction of another group of peoples known as the Tasmanians, natives of Australia. Their society, with a population of 2,000 to 20,000, inhabit the island of Tasmania, 150 miles south of Australia. Their lineage went back over 10,000 years, yet within a single generation they were exterminated. They were generally considered a peaceful society of primitive hunters and gatherers, and had divided themselves into eight tribes that spoke different dialects. Their basic societal group was the extended family. In 1803, 49 British settlers, most of whom were convicts from Australia, landed in southern Tasmania. At first, the Tasmanians welcomed the British and traded with them, just like the Africans and the Native Americans had. However, on May 3, 1804, an incident occurred which led to a massacre. As the story goes, 300 Tasmanian hunters were chasing a kangaroo herd, which led them to the vicinity of a small British encampment. A nervous British lieutenant, thinking the Tasmanians were attacking the camp, ordered cannons to be fired. The frightened Tasmanians picked up their dead and wounded and departed. In retaliation, they then attacked and killed several British oystermen. That was the beginning of a very one-sided war, guns and steel versus wood and rocks, which ultimately resulted in the complete extermination of the Tasmanian people. To be sure, by 1820, some 12,000 British settlers and just 1,000 Tasmanians lived on the island. The settlers considered the Tasmanians as beasts and actually organized hunts, complete with hunting weapons, hounds, and horns to track and kill the natives. Great violence was perpetrated against the Tasmanians. Men were castrated, women were raped and murdered. The settlers shot Tasmanians and fed them to their dogs. The Tasmanian population was further reduced by European diseases, especially syphilis which became an epidemic because of the number of sexual assaults by Englishmen on Tasmanian women. In 1838, the remaining 187 Tasmanian people were transported to Flinders Island off the northwest coast of Tasmania. On this barren, almost waterless isle, the Tasmanians were placed under the care of Anglican missionaries, who forced them to wear clothes and learn Western customs. Demoralized, the few surviving Tasmanians lost their will to live and fell easy victims to disease. In one year, 50 died of pneumonia. Finally, in 1847, the survivors were returned to mainland Tasmania and resettled at Oyster Cove, near the capital city of Hobart. Most of the men became alcoholics, and most of the women turned to prostitution. Wade Davis is a Canadian biologist, anthropologist, and author. His work primarily involves the study of the customs and beliefs of indigenous cultures in North and South America. Davis is an opponent of globalization and works with many non-governmental organizations on behalf of preserving indigenous languages and cultures. He shows humanity's rich cultural diversity and believes that we should learn to preserve those cultural diversities despite the aspiration to become a modern society of people. The following is a portion of Wade Davis's keynote address delivered at a TED Talks gathering. Together, the myriad cultures of the world make up an intellectual, spiritual, and social web of life that envelops the planet and is as important to its well-being as the biological web of life that we know as the biosphere. You might think of this cultural web of life as being an ethnosphere, and you might define the ethnosphere as being the sum total of all the thoughts, dreams, ideals, myths, institutions, and inspirations brought into being by the imagination since the dawn of consciousness. The ethnosphere is humanity's great legacy. It is a symbol of all that we've achieved and the promise of all that we can achieve as the widely curious and adaptive species we are. However, just as a biological web of life, the biosphere is being severely eroded today with the loss of habitat and the concomitant loss of species of plants and animals. So too is the ethnosphere vanishing, but at a far greater rate. 
No biologist would dare suggest, for example, that 50% of all species of life are morbid or on the brink of extinction, because that is simply not true. And yet the same apocalyptic scenario from the realm of biological diversity approaches what we know to be the most optimistic scenario in the realm of a culture diversity. The great indicator of that, of course, is language loss. Now, a language isn't just a body of vocabulary or a set of grammatical rules. A language is a flash of the human spirit. The soul of each particular culture comes into the world through a vehicle. Every language is an old-growth forest of the mind, a watershed of thought, and an ecosystem of spiritual and social possibilities. When I was born, there were 6,000 languages spoken on the earth. But today, fully half of those 6,000 languages are not being whispered into the ears of young children, nor are they being taught to school children. This means effectively that unless something changes, they are already dead. For 2.5 million years, the Earth's climate has fluctuated, cycling from ice ages to warmer periods. But in the last century, the planet's temperature has risen unusually fast, about 1.2 to 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Scientists believe it's human activity that's driving the temperatures up, a process known as global warming. Chapter 8. Imperialism and how it influenced global warming. Call yourself any color you like. White, black, brown, yellow, or tan. Call yourself any religion you like. Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, Christian, or Jewish. If humanity does not work together on the issue of global warming, we are all going to be called toast. 21 million people were evacuated from their homes worldwide in 2013 due to flooding related to climate change, according to National Geographic. Climate change is one of the greatest challenges of our times. This is the message being reported to the UN General Assembly by scientists and concerned leaders worldwide. Global warming is one of the few issues they all agree upon these days, the primary reason being that humans have polluted nature's climate spectrum at such a cataclysmic manner that it now threatens all living, breathing entities on planet Earth. With record-breaking temperatures and irregular weather patterns being reported all across the globe, the evidence is quite clear to even a layperson. Our weather is behaving mighty peculiar. However, you might be curious at this point as to what climate change has to do with the topic of race. In brief, I will explain. Imperialism is the name given to describe the age of discovery. It was a time when explorers sailed around the globe in search of greener pastures, motivated by their belief that they were racially superior, which imbued them with a sense of entitlement. Because of these elevated, erroneous self-beliefs, the theory of manifest destiny became the vehicle by which they set about to accomplish their imperialistic pursuits. Invasions of other lands, disrupting and depressing indigenous peoples, illegal power grabs, and unlawful land acquisitions. The driving motivation of these invading marauders was that total power, total control, was theirs by right of superiority. Revolving fleets of European settlers asserted their dominance over the sea, land, and port of every non-European region on every continent. What was their goal? It was to control all the minerals and natural resources, and to make the whole world one exclusive English colony. Race was formulated as a means to justify their end gain, namely to rule the world under the guise of racial superiority. This practice involved the genocide of millions of indigenous people, along with the destruction of their traditional ways of life, and all that was connecting them to their existing ecosystem. They compounded their damage by killing off millions upon millions of grazing animals. The only choice the native peoples had for survival was to adapt to this foreign way of life that had been forced upon them, and by doing so, ultimately building a dependence on an artificial, unnatural way of life. This extreme man-created method for their survival can rightfully be determined to be one of the greatest blunders in human history. The Hopi natives called this manner of parasitic living Bawakatsi, which means a way of life that consumes the life force of other beings in order to further its own way of life. Thus exploited by the power merchants of the world, this act of dispersing indigenous people, se separating them from their land, spoiling their means of sustaining their lives, killing off their buffalo, elephants, antelope, and other livestock, set off a massive chain reaction with dire environmental consequences. These actions by those seeking absolute power and control caused a major negative impact of consequences that affected and disrupted the structure of thousands of species of plants, birds, insects, humans, and animals, all of which represented an intimate, integral relationship between man and nature. 
The natural law of cause and effect states that all actions have consequences and produce specific results, as do all inactions. Human beings are always at choice, and the choices we make are the causes, whether they are conscious or unconscious, which trigger, determine, and produce the consequences in accordance with those choices. Your choices become the causes that generate the corresponding outcomes. This law states that for every outcome or effect in one's life, there is a specific cause that has been set in motion by our own choices. Poor diet and lack of exercise results in poor health. Constant and uncontrolled spending results in debt and financial insecurity. Neglecting to put effort into your key relationships results in troubled, unfulfilling relationships, along with all of the subsequent attendant issues. We can definitely see how our life choices affect an array of our health issues, mental, emotional, and physical. Our choices, whether we act upon them or not, put in motion the deriving factor, the causes, which in turn determine our outcomes, our consequences. Did racism cause climate change? The Native Americans would call the interconnected marriage to nature the great web of life. They believed that all life was one in nature. Courageous Native Americans like Chief Black Hawk tried in vain to warn the European settlers of the dangers of altering the balance of life they had known from the beginning. Black Hawk said, My strong sense of reason teaches me that land cannot be sold. The Great Spirit gave it to his children to live upon. So long as they occupy and cultivate it, they have the right to the soil. Nothing can be sold. Take care of the land, and it will take care of you. The deadly combination of removing the original tenants from the land, imprisoning and holding hostage feminine energies, has resulted in grave ecological ramifications. Is it any wonder that we are suffering the heat of their actions in the form of global warming? Hunting and gathering, as primitive as this method of life may sound, had an astonishing record of unbridled sustainability. Their simple yet pristine manner of life was an environmental success story for thousands of years. There was no environmental protection agencies. There were only hearts that instinctively knew how to preserve a traditional way of life. Overgrazing by livestock never occurred in areas where the ancient tribesmen served as herdsmen. The act of grazing has a stimulating effect upon the land. It promotes the higher productivity of plant communities by the process known as hoof action. This ancient method occurred naturally by animals roaming and feeding, which aerated and reseeded organic matter back into the soil. For generation after generations, the hunter-gatherer class cohabited with nature, and understanding her complexities, they knew more about the land than any person in the world did. This was because their land was the only home they had ever known. Their simple yet respectful way of life as hunters and gatherers became a fixture in the ecosystem. The mere act of pushing large herds of cattle across vast open grasslands was actually a cooperative natural system in harmony with nature. The integrated process of the trampling motions of humans and animals, grazing, walking, and defecating, produced a permanent nature culture. This permaculture that absorbed rich fertilizers into the soil then nurtured indigenous plants, which in turn naturally facilitated the development of a host of microorganisms, such as mycelium and fungus, that interacts and is structured like an underground information grid. This natural grid forms a unique communication network which consists of all life together, the web of life, in a dedicated, harmonious balance. In addition, this system allows thick root mass to propagate into the earth, which promotes moisture retention at ground level, where it is needed the most. The ground level moisture base creates a microclimate, the cool, moist vapor barrier at ground level, which is mirrored by the microclimate in the atmosphere above, the microcosm, and the microcosm as below, so above. The microclimate on Earth is in direct proportion to the macroclimate above. Thus, this relationship influences our weather. The removal of indigenous people from their tribal land had a long-term domino effect that we are paying for today in the form of climate change, global warming, and desertification the process by which the soil is depleted of its vital nutrients, leading to soil erosion, which releases massive amounts of harmful carbon into the atmosphere, contributing to major climate change. Perhaps you've heard the phrase carbon footprint, mentioned in the news or in several documentaries produced on the topic of climate change. This phraseology is used to represent the impact ratio of each human being on the amount of carbon released into the atmosphere. Carbon soil is a significantly helpful nutrient when kept in its place, it is the natural way of retaining vital nutrients necessary for plant life to flourish. However, when the carbon is released from the soil into the air that we breathe, it produces the dangerous condition known as desertification. This process causes a carbon-loaded gas that fluxes into the atmosphere where it absorbs radiant energy from the sun and stores itself in the air. 
The term used to describe this occurrence is the greenhouse effect. Soil erosion and plant oxidization have adversely affected nearly 50% of the world's land areas. North America and Spain have the largest percentage of arid lands affected. Overgrazing, woodcutting, and the Industrial Revolution are the byproducts of colonialism responsible for most of the desertification. As history documents for us, the colonists left a bloody lineage of disaster behind in wake of their crusades. After years of pillaging, continent to continent, plundering land, eradicating vast buffalo herds, disrupting, dispersing, and killing its native stewards, and their way of life, the ecological toll of imperialism is brutally apparent. Those ambitious men seeking world power and domination had no idea of the chaos and havoc they were inflicting upon the existing ecosystem. The lands they invaded were horribly transformed by the unnatural artificial technology they implemented. These conquered lands were reduced to barren wastelands prone to flooding, food shortages, famine, disease, and extinction. This is the major cause of climate change. Before European settlers came to America, their explorers found black soil, six feet deep down and much thicker in Iowa, Illinois, and the Plains. That soil has now been reduced to mere inches by modern technological agricultural practices. A major project for the coming century would be to reverse these effects. Man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Ancient cultures from time immemorial have repeatedly tried to forewarn us of the time which is now upon us. As the earth is rapidly heating up, more and more people are realizing that whatever they were, calling problems in the past tends to wane in the face of the imminent threat of unmitigated global warming. Global warming is the debate that will end all debates. Prolonged, unrelenting heat disrupts human homeostasis and commands our attention. It will be the catalyst in settling land disputes instantly, silencing mundane conflicts, and ending the threat of wars, with all sides immediately surrendering while futilely waving toasted white flags. How come when you turn on the radio in Jacksonville, or New Orleans, or Chicago, or Little Rock, the only people on the radio that talk about how great it is to kill each other are black? How come that exists? Fifteen stations on a dial, go up, go down. The only people on the radio bragging about getting automatic weapons, gunning each other down, are black. This right here is a song. Uh, my pastoral vocabulary won't let me read the title. Uh, but I will read this. Catch a young black male not paying attention at the red light with your AK-47. Let me see you shoot it. You're a killer, you're a killer, you're a killer. You're a killer, black male. Let me see you prove it. Why does this exist? Chapter 9 Negro meant black, meant death. The etymology of the name black ultimately leads to death, literally. The word negro is Latin for black and derived from the Greek word death, associated with the dark color of a dead body. The root word necro means dead. In urban communities with high rates of homicides, where it names its citizens black and thus hosts so-called black-on-black crimes, abortion is the number one killer amongst the social group classified as black people. 400,000 black babies are aborted every year. We can see the root word necro does not fall far from the genesis of its original meaning. Words are powerful and have a way of subconsciously branding a modality of conduct upon a person's brain or a projection of others that they seldom notice. Some have tried to rehabilitate the name black as it refers to a person with romantic slogans like black is beautiful or I love being black a well-meaning campaign designed to bring a sense of pride to black people or meaning to a person's life that says, my life really matters. I was there during the colored Negro era, and I remember the first day I heard the new title, Black People. James Brown came up with the slogan in a song in the summer of 1975, Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Based upon the staggering statistics of homicide and self-genocide that continue in black communities some 40 years later, in 1992, my brother Ivan Gibson was added to the death toll, another victim of the so-called black-on-black killing marathon. It's evident that we need to try something new. Walla, another new name for African Americans, is the official new title for people of color. Although genetically, all people are of African origin, each person holds the gene marker from Africa. The new name, set aside exclusively for people of color, for African Americans, has not halted, changed or even put a dent in the steady flow of deaths and incarcerations among young people of color. 
Perhaps knowing and understanding the root sentiment behind words will allow a person to add a magical intention of their own, one of loving kindness, which demonstrates a conscious desire to break the spell of hatred associated with the original meaning of the black brand. If a person wishes to call himself or herself any color at all, at least understand the meaning of the words etched into the consciousness and add a sentiment of life and loving kindness to your words. Being willing to try new ideas and solutions is the beginning of life-giving solutions. I'm not saying that I have the magic solution. However, if we keep doing what we've always done, we will keep getting what we've always gotten. What we have always gotten are dead young people. When my brother was murdered at 20 years old, the funeral home director told me that they had 20 other dead children in his parlor. He said none of them were even old enough to be shaved. I'm what you would call a shaker and a mover. Within my lifetime, I expect to see a decrease in the rate of homicides. Try to remember, black is not a name anyone chose for themselves. It was a name branded upon people from Africa by their captors, a name selected and used to identify and keep census on people mixed into the European-based Euro-African population. Negro, necro, or death, came to mean black, because in Western culture black has always been symbolic of death, i.e. black shawls at funerals, black cats served to the devil, the black death, etc. Thus the Greek word necro, death, when translated to Latin becomes negro, black. Historically, in feudal Europe, black was the universal description for impurity. So slave owners, believing their African slaves were impure and socially dead, had no better word to describe them than negro. Sometimes things happen so long ago, people forget to remember where they came from. We use words without ever thinking. We recite and repeat words etched into our minds. African captives were methodically and with intent, brainwashed and converted into slaves. Many indigenous groups around the world were never branded, brainwashed, as negroes, colors, blacks. These are objectifying terms, intentionally reserved for American blacks, who, undoubtedly, were reduced to such an outcome by the institution of slavery. Two assassinated presidents, Lincoln and Kennedy, a slain king, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., a slain prince, Malcolm X, and a host of martyrs have given their lives to what has been called the Negro problem in America. I make no claims to be the one to come forth and unite the Gordian knot, which represents the difficult and intraceable and often the unsolvable problem. I do say that perhaps with the name we bestow so innocently and unconsciously upon our fellow humans may lay a conscious solution. Today we have learned much about melanin, the skin pigment that was previously used as the basis for defining race-based doctrine. During centuries of profound ignorance, it was believed that dark skin was a curse. In modern times, we now have overwhelming evidence to the complete contrary. Melanin is the key to human life itself. Scientists studying melanin's properties have dubbed it the miracle material of the future, having application in over 15,000 new technologies, from medical nanotechnology, anti-aging formulas, to graphite-bonded construction materials, nanomaterials, and buckyballs. We have been found to be hundreds of times stronger than steel and even more resilient than diamonds. Melanin has also been found to conduct heat and electricity far more effectively than copper, while boasting a surprising degree of flexibility. The melanin substrates are also currently used in the field of fiber optic technology. Melanin is an ultra-important component of human life itself. Not all melanin pigments are black, as they vary from black to brown to yellow. Melanin belongs to a family of unique and highly stable molecules that are present throughout nature and are currently being utilized in the health field as follows. Melanin deficiencies associated with fertility issues. Neurodegeneration disorders, diseases of the central nervous system caused by exposure to radiation. Melanin has been found to aid in the recovery of neurons that have been injured as a result of direct injury or disease, etc. In fact, the therapeutic uses of melanin and its derivatives outlined above have already been patented by the U.S., and the melanin technology has already become a multi-billion dollar industry. Skin pigmentation is an important factor when it comes to aging, since melanin, besides functioning as a broadband UV absorbent, has antioxidant and radical scavenging properties. Many epidemiological studies have shown a lower incidence for skin cancer in individuals with darker skin compared to those with fair skin. Melanin is being celebrated as a veritable fountain of youth as it slows the aging process and protects our skin from the damaging effects of sunlight. The darker your skin is, the slower it ages. Thus, lighter-skinned people often experience premature aging due to a lack of melanin-mediated protection. Melanin is also crucial to human reproduction. Melanin-sheathing envelopes cover both the sperm and the egg. In the human embryo, 
The melanocytes, skin pigment cells, brain and nerve cells all originate from the same place, the neural crest. Melanocytes resemble nerve cells and are essential for conducting electrical impulses. Insufficient amounts of melanin in the ectoderm of the early embryo, blastula stage, are a major cause of miscarriages. Black melanin is a super absorber of all forms of energy. It has black hole properties. It can convert light to sound to electricity and back again. Melanin stores, transforms, and conducts energy. Melanin can also rearrange its chemical structure to absorb all wavelengths of energy, sunlight, x-rays, music, radar, and it can transmute and store this energy for later usage. In the ISIS papers, Dr. Kress Wilsing writes, Melanin gives us the ability to use our bodies as direct connections with the God Force, the source of all energy, very much in the same way that plugging a cord into a wall socket enlivens and energizes an electronic system, like a computer. Melanin also gives our hair antenna-like ability. Reflected light is wave light, i.e. sunlight, in the visible range of humans, whereas absorbed energy is black in color. Because all wavelengths are absorbed, melanin does indeed absorb light energy, sound energy, and electromagnetic energy. Melanin has many other interesting properties too, such as ultraviolet absorption, where it is currently being utilized in its preparation of UV-absorbing optical lenses and in cosmetic creams. The colors of melanin are those of a pure semiconductor. As with other black materials, such as graphite and fullerenes, melanin can conduct electricity without resisting the flow of electricity. This means that melanin has superconducting capabilities. It also behaves like an insulator in that it will not allow electrical current to pass through its structure, similar to rubber and plastic insulators. The added ability of melanin to undergo polymerization is of great interest in industry for its nanotechnological application and bioplasts and biopolymers. It comes to no surprise that stocks have raised steadily through 2012 in companies that market technologies based on the wondrous properties of melanin. If we examine the pigmentation of people according to their ancestral indigenous region, we would find the exact shade of melanin in the skin needed to sustain life. Hotter regions like sub-Sahara Africa with intense sunlight would require a darker shade of melanin. Humans in mid-latitude regions above and below the equator necessarily evolved browner melanin and in colder regions beyond, like, like in Siberia, produce humans with a beige skin color. Nature changes, evolves, and comes into equilibrium according to the needs of the organism in its environment. Thus, evolution gave our ancestors the ultraviolet skin protection necessary for them to make the journey around the globe, and essentially enabled us all to be here now.